And as you turn to Acts chapter 13, what you're going to realize is Acts, this, this statement, this, this scripture that we're going to kind of focus on today uh, and, and kind of use as a, as a jumping off point um, is in the middle of, of uh, essentially a message, and, and this section of the message essentially is saying this, Jesus is better than David. Okay, and you could put, you could take David's name out and then put anybody else's name, and that would be right, wouldn't it? Right, Jesus is better. And so Acts chapter 13, verse number 36, it says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. This is in the midst of, of talking about how Jesus came back to life. He didn't see corruption. So that's the context. Here's the part we're going to kind of just pull out just a little bit today. Just this first part. Let's read just the first part together. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation. That's really going to be what we focus on today. Uh, when I was a kid, I got in trouble a lot because I, I wasn't mean. I was just mischievous. Anybody else kind of identify with that? You just were kind of always doing something, and it wasn't anything super bad, super destructive. It was just annoying, right? Annoying to the people around me. And, and can I tell you, I came by that honestly. I came by that honestly. My dad just instilled that into me, and it got passed into the genetics, and that's just part of it. Um, it's just kind of being mischievous. It, it's, I think it's part of being a boy, too. Part of being a boy is sometimes you just you mess with stuff. You mess with people. You do things you shouldn't do. Well, one of the things, of the many things, that I did that I shouldn't have done, I, mean, I remember being a little kid, and you ever done this when you were in the back seat of the car? Some of you remember maybe you were even in the, the rear-facing station wagon seat, right? And you blew on the window, like, and then you rode on it. My dad hated that. And now as a dad, I hate when my kids do it. Oh, it's all steamed up. I'm going to ride on there. I, I, I heard a story this week about a little boy who was doing that as cars drove by and he was writing mean notes to them as they came by. And so they would get, all of a sudden, some of the cars, they were so mean, some of the cars were, cars were honking at the parents as they were driving by. But because the vapor would kind of be there and it would be gone, a lot of times the, the parents didn't see it. And so this little boy, he thought he was getting away with something until his dad, when they pulled over to stop for a restroom break, went back to the window and blew on it himself, and then he could see what was written. That, that guy got in some trouble. He got in some trouble. But some of you, you've heard this because Scripture talks about this, that life is like a vapor. Life is a vapor. It's here one minute, and it's gone the next. One of the challenges that we have as human beings, as people, especially as God's people, is to use our life well, to honor the Lord with the life that we have, because this life is short. I want you to think for a second, if the front edge of this stage represented eternity, etern okay, and so, so let's say we're right here, and this is eternity past and eternity future. If you want to kind of make your head hurt, there's a couple things you can do. One, to think about that direction, it never stops. Right? It just goes and goes and goes, and there's not an end. But if you really want to make your head hurt, you, what we also need to understand is that direction never stops. God has always been. He will always be. But here we are, and we step into, as God's kind of planted us here at this place for this time in this life. If, if this edge of the stage represented eternity, how small a little section do you think you're maybe 70 years would be. It'd be. Wouldn't it be tiny? It, it, honestly, if this represented all of eternity, it would be so small we couldn't see it. And we get worked up. We get worried about what's going to happen next. We get all bent out of shape over what happened yesterday. I mean, it's not even basketball season, y'all. And we're losing to Kentucky, right? Not you, but we. Okay? We get bent out of shape about what's happened in the past. We get worried and anxious about what's going to happen in the future. And God's saying, don't miss it. Don't miss it. David served the Lord's purpose in his generation. And can I tell you, so should we. So should we. Now, you, if you know anything about the life of David, you know that he, he dropped the ball a few times, 
right? He dropped the ball a few times. But even after all of this, what does God say of him? He's a man after my own heart. And we can learn a lot from the life of David. And we're going to kind of look at maybe four pictures today of what it would look like for us serving Christ's purpose in our lives while we can. Listen, while we can. Listen, while we can. Don't, and can I just say this? Don't, let's just stop putting stuff off. Let's just, let's just, we'll cut to the chase just for a second. Let's stop putting stuff off that God's put on our heart to do. Let's stop putting it off. Um, so how, how can we serve God's purpose in, the, in this generation? God's planted us here. Listen, do you realize that God is so big and so strong and so sovereign? You could have been born anywhere at any time. But he put you here and now. So let's not waste it. So how can I serve God's purpose in my life? We're going to kind of look at the life of David because it says here that David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, you kind of can't do it in other people's generation. You have to do it in yours, right? Okay, how can we serve God in our own generation? Well, I'm just going to pull out four big rocks today. Here's the first one. It starts with a love for God. It starts with a love for God. Acts 13, 22 says, And when he had rem uh, removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. David wrote at least 73 psalms that we see from Scripture, at least that many. Some are debated. Did he write this one? Did he write that one? We say that we can see that he wrote at least 73. And David was a man of worship. You remember that he, in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, he danced before the Lord. He danced, the scripture even talks about he danced naked before the Lord. And his wife laughed at him and made fun of him. And what was his response to that? His response to that was essentially, you know what? I'm just getting started. I'll become I'll, even more undignified than this. Why? Why? As you look back over that text, it's, there's this period where the Ark of, of the Covenant was, was out of Israel. But it gets brought back in, and David is celebrating, listen, the presence of God. And if for you and I, if you've put your faith in Jesus, Holy Spirit is in you. He is in you, and he is with you. And so our lives should be lives of worship. Loving God in part looks like worship. In part, it looks like worship. In Psalm chapter 63, verses 1 through 5, uh, the psalm says this, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, behold, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. This is not hyperbole. David goes on, my lips will praise you, so I, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. David understood that only God could truly satisfy. So we chase after all kinds of crazy stuff, thinking it's going to fill us up. But really, if you, if you know Christ, we have everything we could ever desire. Listen, David was king. And he says, you know what? I'm in, it's, like in, it's like I'm in a dry and weary land, and I, I'm, I'm starving, and I'm thirsty, and only you can satisfy Jesus. He says, your love is better than than life. You know how David was able to love God and able to live a life of worship? That came from understanding that he was already loved by God. He was loved by God, so he was able to love God and love people. And so David says this. David loved God, you know what, even when times were difficult. Even when times were difficult, David loved God. Psalm chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 5 and 6. I want to read this to you. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Anybody ever felt like that? How long? Because this is not, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Right? No one says it like that. I mean, if you're saying this, you're saying, how long? How many of you that are in school have ever thought, how long? <laughs> right? 
How many of you have been in a, in a difficult marriage, a difficult season in your marriage, and you kind of think, how long? You've been in a difficult, difficult place with your kids, difficult place with your parents, difficult place with, with whatever's going on in life, finances, whatever, and you think, how long? David responds after this, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? You ever felt like God forgot you? I mean, he hasn't, but sometimes we can feel that way, can't we? And David's just honest. Look at the next thing he says. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Anybody ever felt like that? You feel like, man, this person, they're not living for the Lord, but they're just like, they're having victory over me. Why? How long? Then verse 5 and 6. Look at verses 5 and 6. But... But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation, as opposed to what I might try to do for myself to get myself out of this. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. See, the Lord sustained him in good times, and he looked to the Lord to sustain him during difficult times. Why? Because he loved God, and he was loved by God. There's this passage of Scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 24, and I have always thought this is one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture. I, I want to read this little section to you. I think it's coming up on the screen. Follow along with me as I do. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And Gad came uh, that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Arana looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming toward him. And Arana went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. So you catch the picture. David's been told, go and make this type of sacrifice at this place. Arana's coming out he's, and he sees the king showing up, okay? And so he bows down, verse 21. And Arana said, why has the Lord my lord, the king, come to his servant. David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the, pe uh, plague may be averted from the people. Then Arana said to David, let my lord, the king, listen to this, let my lord, the king, take up, uh, take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arana gives to the king. And Arana said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. Now listen, so what's happened? David shows up. He's like, I'm going to buy what I need for the offering. And Arana's like, no, you know what? You're king. Here, just take it. Just take it. What does David do? I love this. I have always loved this response. Look at this response. Verse 24, but the king said to Arana, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Do you catch that? When you love the Lord, one of the things that it looks like is that you sacrifice for what God calls you to do. That might be your time. That might be your energy. It might be finances. It might be preference. But David says, I'm not going to serve the Lord if it costs me nothing, but, uh, essentially because that's not really serving the Lord. Look at what it goes on and says, So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So, listen to this, So the Lord responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. It goes on in chapter, in chapter 51 of the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 51, David has sinned with Bathsheba, and we see here, and Psalm 51, why don't you just turn there with me real quick. Psalm 51. Is it on the screen already? No. Okay, Psalm 51. I want you guys to check this out real quick. Just the first part of this. We won't read the whole psalm. Psalm 51, look at what David says at the very beginning. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast, what's that next word? Love. Living a life that serves God's purpose for your generation, it looks like loving God. 
expressed in worship. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Love looks like obeying. Love looks like trusting God. So loving means loving his people, and loving God means sacrificially following him. Pastor Carl, thank you for loving the Lord enough to make whatever sacrifices it took to serve here. So second, so first we're going to say we're a love for God. Second, understanding and fulfilling the purpose that God has for us. We need to understand and fill the purpose God has for us. David says in Psalm 57 verse 2, I cry out to, my, uh, to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Did you know this? God has a purpose for you. He's got specific things for you that he's going to call you out to. He has purpose for you. And listen, you are not an accident. You're not an accident. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. For what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the question is, well, what's God's purpose for me? What's God's purpose for my life? What's God's will for my life? Can I just give you a couple, of, a couple of just perspectives here, just for a moment? Some of us, we need to understand that God does have a specific will for our life, but in order for you to experience and understand what that's going to be, you need to follow what God's general will is for your life that you already see from his word. Some of us are waiting on God to give us that one specific thing, and we're disobeying what he's already told us. And listen, sometimes God's, God's will for your life is less like a keyhole and more like go east. And as you're walking, I'll show you. But some of us are looking for the keyhole and we haven't seen it, so we're just not doing anything. Obey what you know God's called you to do, even if it's a general sense. And as you're walking, He'll show you the specifics. Amen? So understand our purpose. We need to understand our purpose. When, um, when God called Pastor Carl and Miss Sally to a specific ministry, we benefited. But can I tell you, they were just kind of, the Lord was saying, I go this way. And so they were walking, and when they, they took some steps, and the Lord opened this door, said, okay, Lord, is this what you want us to do? Is this how you want us to serve in this next season? The Lord said yes, so they obeyed. And look what we're getting to, to experience today in part because of how God used them in our lives. Because God's man was seeking to fulfill God's purpose for his generation, we were benefited. But listen, that doesn't just apply to pastors. You might not be called to, to be a pastor, but you're called according to God's purpose. And let's serve it. Because listen, we're all part of one body. And when one, one part suffers, all parts suffer. But also when one part isn't doing what God's called it to do, all parts suffer. So we need to understand and fill God's will for our life. Let me, just a couple of things. Well, what's God's will? Give me, let me just give you a couple of these general uh, things. Number one, God's will for your life is that you would know him and make him known. Amen. Wouldn't we agree with it, that God's word teaches that, that God wants us to know him and to make him known? Jesus in the high priestly prayer in John 17 says this. He says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Listen, we need to know the Lord personally, but it's not just us. Other people need to know the Lord. So we've got to go and make him known as we live our lives. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 also says this, for this is the will of God. Your sanctification. See, sanctification is the process of you becoming more and more like Jesus. God's will for your life is that you would know him, that you would make him known, and that every day as you grow in your faith, you look more and more like the character of Christ, like the heart of Christ. You look more and more, you and I, that we look more and more like Jesus. And if we seek to live this way, we will be fulfilling God's purpose in our generation. So first, we need to love God. We need to understand and live God's purpose for us. And then third, we need to walk by faith. Walk 
by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says this, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen? Oh, yes. Does this conjure up any Indiana Jones scenes for you right now? A little bit, right? He's stepping out onto the bridge and he can't see it, right? Listen, when you walk with God, he's going to call you to do some stuff that might not sound normal. I mean, what kind of battle plan is walk around the city, put the band in the front? Once a day, on the seventh day, you're going to walk around it seven times. Everybody be quiet until the end. This is not a normal battle strategy. God didn't tell him cut off the water, source of the city. God didn't tell him, okay, let's, let's sneak up in the middle of the night. We're going to plant some explosives. None of that. Walk around, put the band in the front. Seriously? Joshua, if I'm Joshua, I'm going, this is not a good plan. This is not, <laughs> this is not a good plan. But when God says it, is it a good plan or not? And so what do we do? How do we respond? We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Can I give you a couple of examples from, uh, from David's life? Remember in 1 Samuel 17, David's a ruddy little punk, not even old enough to be in the army yet. He shows up, and for like 40 days, this nine-foot-tall giant has been screaming blasphemy against God's people and against God, cursing and just like talking like to them like they're dogs. The Philistines are on one side of the valley. Israel's on the other side of the valley. And this guy's going, come on, just me, one of me versus one of you. If I win, you guys belong to us. If you win, we belong to you. Let's go, bring it. For 40 days, silence, fear, nothing. And then this little shepherd shows up. And what does he do? Well, he, he annoys his older brothers because <laughs> that's what little brothers do. But he steps out in faith, doesn't he? 1 Samuel chapter 17. I just want to read this little section here to you as David is uh, um, addressing Goliath. This is awesome. Don't you just love in God's Word sometimes where people talk smack to people? That's one of my favorite things, right? And Elijah and the prophets of Baal, it's like, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's relieving himself somewhere. You should probably be louder. And they're like, yeah, that's a good idea. And so they do it. Anyway. <clears throat> At the end of 1 Samuel 17, it says, And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This is in the Bible, y'all. Like... <laughs> Head cutting off, yeah. Some, some of our uh, younger guys just went, I have got to start reading the Old Testament. Yes, you do. All right. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all the, this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. And we know what happens next, don't we? The Philistine comes. David runs at him. He's not, he's not back on his heels. He runs at him. He loads up the sling in one shot, takes this giant down. David doesn't even have a sword. It's like, okay, there's a sword. Goliath's sword. I'm going to take his sword. And he takes Goliath's sword and cuts his head off with his own sword. Can I tell you? Doesn't matter how big you are. Doesn't matter how strong you are. Doesn't matter how smart you are. It matters how big your God is. And we can walk by faith. There's another example, I think, of David walking by faith. 1 Samuel chapter 24. 
He's, uh, he's been run off by, by King Saul, and David's hiding back in this, ta- this cave, deep in this cave. And the king comes into the same cave to relieve himself. And while he's preoccupied with what he's doing, David's men are trying to tell him, hey, go kill him. Go kill the king. God's, put him into you. God's given him into your hand. And David goes up, and he doesn't kill Saul. He cuts a little corner off of his robe, off of his garment, sneaks back, in, back into the deeper part of the cave again. The Bible says in 1 Samuel uh, 24, David gets convicted about even doing that. Saul finishes what he's doing, leaves the cave. David comes out to show him what he's done. But as he's back in the cave, before Saul leaves, his men are like, just go kill him. God's given him to you. Just go kill him. And here's David's response. I can't raise up against the Lord's anointed. In other words, God's not done with him whatever he's going to do. It's, he's, not, he's not done with Saul yet. I'm not going to step in the place of God and try to take control here. That's essentially what David says. God anointed him king, and when God says he's done, he's done. Not when David says he's done, he's done. And David walked by faith, even when circumstances looked like, oh, God has opened a door. <laughs> he walked by faith. He trusted the Lord. And, and in our lives, guys, we have got to walk by faith. Last. So we're going to love God. We're going to understand and live God's purpose for our life. We're going to walk by faith. And then last, we've got to live with the end in mind. Live with the end in, in mind. You, do you understand what that means? See, smart people start at the end and try to work backwards. Wise people do that. Okay, I can't control everything. I don't know all these details, but here's where I want to go. And let's work backwards from there to see how maybe we're supposed to go about getting there. David says in Psalm 23, verse 6, I want to read this to you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then what does he say? And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want you to listen to me, church family. If you know Jesus, you're going to be with God one day. And listen, in that timeline of eternity, it's like we're living, like our 70 years is maybe this, and it's just forever. Wouldn't it be smart to live with that in mind? Because how we live in this affects our experience forever in that. So let's be faithful here. Listen, while we can. Because this is the only generation you get. This is it. Are we going to serve God now? Or are we going to miss out? Can I tell you, God's not, he's not dependent on us, but he, he loves using his children. He loves us getting to be a part of what he's doing. But just like in the book of Esther in chapter 4, where her uncle is saying, maybe for such a time as this, God's put you in the kingdom. But even if you don't, he's going to raise up deliverance somewhere, from somewhere else. Let's not be people that God looks at and goes, well, I guess I better raise up deliverance from somewhere else. Let's be people who, who God looks at and says, you know what? When I speak to them, they follow me. And if you live your life like that, when you get to the end, you'll look back and you'll be grateful, but you'll also look back and you'll see, look what God did. Look what God did. Today, today in a little little way, it's kind of like when they crossed the Jordan River. And as the the Ark of the Covenant and the priests were standing in the middle of the river, Joshua sent back an elder from each of the 12 tribes. He said, get a stone. Get the stones out from the middle, and we're going to make a pillar right over here. 
We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make this pillar unto the Lord right here. And in the future, when your kids ask you, what's, what's the deal with all the rocks? <laughs> You'll tell them, you know what? Those rocks used to be right over there. Where? Like in the water? Yeah. Well, was there a drought? Mm-mm. God just stopped it and we walked across. They were in the bottom, in the middle. But look at what God did. Today, as we look back, we get to say, look at, look at what God did. Look at what God did. And so let, let's let that faithful testimony encourage us. Not that we live looking back, but that it would motivate us as we walk forward and God calls us to do other stuff that maybe doesn't sound normal. But we look back and we say, he, we trusted it in then, and look what he did. So let's trust him now so we'll get to see what he's going to do. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And we're so thankful, God, that you allow us to know you. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of those who have come before us. And Lord, please, by your grace, Help us to be faithful so that if you tarry, Lord Jesus, in your coming, because of our faithfulness, many will come to know you. And they'll have to serve you in their own generation. But help us not to to put all that weight on them. Lord, help us to serve you in our generation. Thank you, Lord, that David said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you for that. And Lord, today, Lord, may that be true of us. May that be said of us. And Lord, if there's anyone in this room who does not know you, if there's anyone in this place, they've never put their faith in you, Jesus. Help them to understand that your goodness and your mercy are still fo- are chasing them, Lord. And, 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 it's, and your goodness and your mercy are offered to them. Your goodness and mercy, and it has only come because of Jesus. Jesus, you delivered the ultimate example, the ultimate of God's goodness. The, 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 the depth of God's goodness to us was in you and your sacrifice on the cross and your resurrection. And because of that, Lord, you can offer mercy and you offer grace to anyone who will call upon your name to be saved. So today, if you're in this place, if you're streaming with us, I ask you, I implore you, by the mercies of God, put your faith in Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross to take your punishment. And he came back to life to prove that he really did what he said he did. And he really is the Son of God. Anyone who calls upon his name will be saved. Today, from your seat in this place or wherever you're streaming, would you do that today? Call upon his name and tell him, Jesus. I'll tell you right now, Jesus, I've sinned. And my sin separates me from you, Jesus. But God, I put my faith in your son. I put my faith in you, Jesus. I turn from my sin, and from this point forward, I will follow you because you paid the price. You took the punishment that I deserved. And now, because you are alive again, because you have risen from the dead, Jesus. I want to have new life. Save me. Save me now. If that's you, whether you're in this room or online, you need to understand something. If that was the decision you made, your heart was to to turn from your sin and to trust Christ, placing your faith in Him, can I tell you, you made the best decision of your entire life today. You made the best decision of your entire life. Can I tell you in a moment, we're going to do an invitation You need to tell somebody. 
You need to tell somebody. You can come up and tell one of us. The elders are going to be down front. You can tell if you're with a, a spouse, a parent, a friend, whoever. You need to tell somebody. Because when Jesus comes in and he changes our lives, that's not something we keep silent. That's not something we keep secret. It's, it's, a, it's a personal relationship, but it's not a private one. Amen? Today, if you do know the Lord, are you serving the Lord in your generation? Some of you may be convicted today like, man, I don't know. Sometimes, I hope. Some of you may say, Eric, I'm a senior adult and and maybe it's too late for me. If you are still drawing breath, it is not too late. It is not too late. Some of you say, well, Eric, I'm just, I'm just, I'm young. I'm just a middle schooler. What can I do? Can I tell you, I've seen middle schoolers do amazing things in the name of Jesus and everywhere in between age-wise. Eric, you don't know what I've done. No, you know what? I don't. But I know what Jesus did. And what he did is way bigger and way stronger than anything you could have done. And he can forgive you and he can change you. He can take your mess and make it part of your message if you let him. If you just offer it to him, say, okay, God. What is God saying to you today? Walk by faith, even if it sounds funny. Even if it sounds like this is, this is not normal. Walk by faith in your response today. Lord, give us grace to respond however you lead, Jesus. And we'll give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.